The title of my, my talk is Open is Not Enough, Sustainability, Innovation, and Equality in Scholarly Communication. And I think what's underlying that is that we as a community have been too narrowly focused on moving from subscription-based um, uh, access to open access. And because of that, we're missing some of the very important other values that we need to ensure are included in the system. So I'm going to do a little rant at the beginning of my talk, um, which basically provides the rationale as to why I don't think our system is right now sustainable, innovative, or equal. And then I'm going to talk about a project that um, CORE has been working on um, to try to create a, a, a knowledge commons similar to what Stuart was talking about based on repositories. Um, and one of the, the keys, the features of this knowledge commons is that collectively we all need to participate in that. So I, I won't go through this, but um, just briefly to mention CORE. We are an international organization, as David said, and we're working with repositories and other organizations that support repository initiatives around the world. We have, um, as our members, we have governments um, from Latin America, which are pushing repositories very strongly, but also institutions and not-for-profit organizations. Okay, so there's been a lot of talk about the Sustainable Development Goals, and um, I recently did some work for IFLA, um, providing the rationale for why access to information and open access and open science is critical for sustainable development, and it's actually cross-cutting. It's critical for almost all, achieving almost all of these Sustainable Development Goals. Um, but I think equally important is that the system that we use for sharing and disseminating um, knowledge must also be sustainable. And sustainability is not one issue. It's not economic sustainability. Sustainability is, is a holistic issue. We need to take an, into account multiple dimensions. The ecology, the society, people, how it, th these, it impacts people, and economics. All in the meantime, considering the long-term prosperity of things. So um, may we take the sustainability lens for a moment and look at the scholarly publishing system. Well, first of all, this is not news for anybody in this room, the ridiculous price for scholarly journals. Um, this is from the Library Journal's study of, of average price per titles. And you can see here, again, I'm sure this is not a surprise for any of you, but some of the titles, journal titles, go up to um, over $4,000 per title. Of course, most of us don't buy um, journals title by title anymore. We buy them in the big deals. And um, the big deals are now something that we are completely locked into. Um, this is a really interesting study that was done at the University of Montreal looking at um, what real usage are we getting from the big deals that we subscribe to uh, from our, our, our researchers. And it was a kind of a multi-pronged study. One, they looked at the usage statistics of journals, I think, over, uh, of titles over the five years. And they also did a survey of their researchers asking them to identify what are the main titles that are important to them. And ultimately, the conclusion was that out of the 50,000 journals that they are um, receiving through the big deals, only about 3,000 were considered critical for the research being done by their university researchers. So uh, that is, that's unbelievable that we're paying all this money for all these journals that are actually not being used or, or, and are not of interest to the researchers on campus. Of course, when you go and approach the publishers and you say, well, actually, we only want these 3,000 journals, they'll give you a great offer of paying 80% of what you're already paying now. So um, despite asking for 15% 
of the journals, you're, the, the, the publishers will, will offer you an 80%, uh, you know, the 80% of the price. Um, so as we move to uh, open access um, and start shifting towards paying article processing charges, again, the, the fee, the costs of that are significant. This is from 2016. And the average cost for the APC, according to a JISC survey here in the UK, was uh, 1,700 pounds or so. Um, I asked them for updated figures for this um, presentation, but they won't have any updated figures until May. So apparently in May, we're going to find out whether that price has gone up or whether it has gone down or is, uh, is the same. Um, so I think there's a lot of talk in the community, and I think especially in, on, on the continent. I don't know about here in, um, here in the UK, but uh, the Max Planck proposal, OA 2020, to um, work towards flipping from, uh, from subscription-based to open access. And I'm, I'm very skeptical about this. First of all, I don't think the publishers want this to happen. And second of all, even if it does happen, I don't think it will reduce the costs of, of journals. So we've seen recently um, the Finnish group try to stick their heels in around um, negotiating towards more open access. And I don't think they made a lot of headway in their negotiations. And they finally reached a deal with Elsevier. Um, the South Koreans also have reached a deal with Elsevier without really um, get making any headway along in, in the, in the, in the, towards greater open access and without really getting any significant discounts. And we've been watching closely the Germans with the deal project. And so we'll see what happens with that. They're still in negotiations and we'll see if the Germans can, can hold out for, um, again, either lower prices, but also more options around open access. Um, one of the things that's very concerning um, in this um, direction for CORE, because we're an international organization, is that many of our members are not able to um, pay article processing charges. Actually, some of our member countries, I was just in Nepal, for example, their library budget is equivalent to one APC. So it's just not an option. It's not an option that we can present as a, an option that can scale globally. Um, and to add to that, they don't want to be charity cases. They want to participate fully in, uh, in the system. So moving from the sustainability lens to the innovation lens, um, innovation is the application of better solutions that meet new requirements, unarticulated needs, and, and existing market needs. And so how innovative have we been with uh, the scholarly journal publishing system? Nah, not very much. <laughs> kind of looks the same. It's color. <laughs> it's in digital format. It has a picture. But really, essentially, the journal article has not changed very much over the last 350 years. And this is a quote from uh, your speaker on Wednesday, I believe, um, Catherine Stiller, and she was talking about copyright, why things were not moving in, in, in the copyright discussion, but I think it, it's very, uh, um, it, it fits perfectly when we talk about scholarly publishing as well. The profit motive of the commercial publishers perpetuates um, these problems um, this is about keeping profit from models that are outdated. And then if we look at um, equality, well, according to the University of Edinburgh, equality is ensuring that individuals or groups are not treated differently or less favorably based on protected characteristics, including race, gender, disability, religion, and so on. So um, how equal is the scholarly communication, scholarly publishing system right now? Well, it's extremely unbalanced, and I want to give you some examples from my recent travels. This is, uh, unfortunately, it's from 2011, but it's a kind of visualization of the research output of um, different countries around the world. 
and uh, you can see there's a couple of very bloated areas, including the United States, North America in general, and, and Western Europe. I'm, I think it has changed because China now is becoming one of the biggest um, research producers in the world. So if we, if we um, looked at this map today, it would still be very small in the south, but, um, but China, I think, would be much larger. So uh, here are some examples I wanted to give you about, um, to, just to, to demonstrate how unequal the system is. This is, uh, Chagas disease is a, is a disease that has been around for hundreds of years, mainly in southern um, South America, Brazil, Argentina. Um, but it was interesting, a recent PLOS article was talking about the 10-year history of Chagas disease. And why is PLOS talking about a 10-year history of Chagas disease? Because Chagas finally made its way up to the United States and Europe about 10 years ago. So there's very little published on, in the international journals about Chagas disease until finally, you know, somebody in the United States um, contracted it. Um, this is from my recent trip to Nepal, and this was a, an analysis of the um, publication output of Nepalese scholars. And uh, the, the two circles that you see are um, specific uh, issues that are important to Nepal. So they have some infectious diseases that are in, in, in Nepal and the Himalayas that are <coughs> unique to that country. Um, and if you look at the other circle on the right, they, they, they have a, something called mountain sickness that's in very, very important there and uh, is related to the high altitude. Um, so the problem is, is that it's very challenging for them to publish information about these diseases in the international journals because they're, it's not of interest to other scholars in general. It's a very um, problems that are very specific to their country. Um, yet, as with Chile, the Nepalese scholars feel incredible pressure to publish in high-impact prestige journals. So the credit that they receive for their research and for their contributions are measured by publishing in high-impact journals, in the international journals, yet the problems that are important to them are local problems. Um, you may have heard of Latin America and how strong they are around uh, scholarly publishing. They have a whole journal system called Cielo, which publishes local journals in, in many of the Latin American countries. It started in Brazil, but has gone to a lot of other countries in, in South America. But I was in Havana last week speaking with some Chilean scholars who said, oh yeah, we have Cielo, but um, when I go to my promotion and tenure committee, I only get six points if I publish in a Cielo journal, but I get 10 points if I publish in an international journal. So despite having their own system, a very vibrant and trusted system for publishing journals, it's still weighted less than if they publish in the international journals. Um, so this is a publication, I think you, um, Stuart might have referenced uh, uh, this research project, which is being led, was led by Leslie Chan at the University of Toronto and funded through the International Development Research Council in Canada. And they went around and, and did basically an analysis of open access in developing countries. And they found really that open access was not helping m make things equal in, in those countries. Um, so I'll just read quickly here, um, starting with, when researchers gain access to the international scientific journals, they're not gaining access to a repository of knowledge that represents the plurality and diversity of knowledge and science produced around the world. Rather, de they're dealt with articles that do not include Global South perspectives, giving more visibility and thus legitimacy to knowledge in the Global North. So it's a key and recognized problem in the Global South, for sure. Um, but I, I don't think it's only a problem in the Global South. Um, one of the, the most critical issues in Canada right now, I mean, aside from living beside Donald Trump, um, <laughs> is, is, is our, our Aboriginal community, our Indigenous community, and how they can be better integrated 
into, into our society. And so there's the research that we do around um, indigenous support, indigenous needs in Canada, of course, does not get published in the international journals, but is published in the local Canadian journals. But in Canada, we're in the same position. Our journals, our local journals that might publish content that's really valuable for our society are not treated to, at the same level by the assessment, the people who are assessing research outputs. So this is Leslie Chan, who I mentioned before, and he talks about how openness is not simply about gaining access to knowledge, but about the right to participate in the knowledge production process, driven by issues of local relevance rather than research agendas set elsewhere from the top. Um, this is a Nobel Prize winner. Now, I've forgotten where he's based, but he might be based here in the UK. Um, and he has said his whole lab, his whole team, are boycotting uh, publishing in luxury journals because it encourages researchers to cut corners and pursue trendy fields of science. And so I think we can see that by all the measures of sustainability, innovation, and equality, our current publishing system is really failing us. And I think really the crux of the issue is the incentive system that we have, how we assess research outputs, how we assess the value of research, and how that system is based on the journal system. So Timothy Gowers at the last Open Repositories meeting, I'm sure you all know Timothy, he's at uh, Cambridge, he's a math professor, very well known, talked about how these are just, that researchers are living with these perverse incentives that force them to publish in venues um, in order to, get, to be recognized. So it's a vicious cycle, you know. You think about, geez, I need promotion and tenure. What can I do my research on where I can get published in one of these big journals? Um, then, I, then I publish. I have fame and fortune and everybody recognizes me. I have more money. And I think of another research problem again that will allow me to, have, to continue to publish in those areas. And um, just to show you an example, I mean, I've heard of um, researchers who have told me, ah, well, in my promotion and tenure committee, I just count the, the impact factor of the journals of every person coming in. So, uh, um, and this is one of the international rankings of universities. 40% of the ranking of the university is based on publications and where, where the researchers are publishing. So 20% is just on whether they've published in nature or science. So Timothy Gowers calls it perverse incentives, and this is my, um, <laughs> my illustration of what I think our system looks like. Um, and these are actually real goats. They're Moroccan tree goats. And, and their handlers teach them when there's a drought to go up and eat food, climb up the, the tree and eat the, 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 the leaves off the tree. But, you know, of course, those ones are the ones that represent the researchers that have been able to, you know, figure out how to work the system. And then the other goats around the ground are the ones who are starving and who are kind of falling outside of the system. Um, so many of you have probably read this Guardian article. I think it came out last year sometime. Um, and the, it asked, the title asked, is the staggeringly profitable business of scientific publishing bad for science? And overwhelmingly, the conclusion was in this article, yes. And for the reasons that I have basically just mentioned. So the journals control... Um, where researchers publish, because they control impact factor and prestige, and then they can make a lot of profit off that. But I think even more worrisome is um, what's happening with the entire life cycle of research. So over the last 10 years or so, we've seen the journals, the, big, the large international publishers buy up more and more journals, kind of 
owning the horizontal layer of journal publishings, where we have about five big publishers that own the majority of the journal titles. But what we're seeing now is they're also buying up, whoops, they're also buying up vertically all of the other services that feed into the entire life cycle of, of research, um, of scholarly communication. So um, this, uh, of course, recently you've heard of the B Press acquisition by Elsevier, but they own Mendeley and um, they own Scopus. And you can see what their, um, their strategy is, is to really, really own both at the horizontal level as many journal titles as they can and at the vertical level as many other services so they can integrate them together. A pure is another example. So this is the situation that we're in, and um, I'm not convinced that whether we move towards greater open access or stay in a subscription-based model, that things are going to get a lot better. Uh, some of you may have seen this tweet a couple days ago. I, I tried to read the article, but it was blocked. <laughs> so, um, but Elsevier's profits swell to more than 900 million pounds. And then underneath it says, but the risks of open access and a shift away from subscriptions could halt growth. But I, I don't believe it for a second. So that's kind of my rant. And, and I'd like to spend the second half of my talk um, presenting to you an alternative vision, um, and that is to take back control of the scholarly communication system by strengthening and expanding the institutional role in managing scholarly output. And from the core perspective, we see the repository network as a network to start being able to do this. Um, but of course, the elephant in the room is that repositories really just collect content that's already published elsewhere. So how can we change the system when we are, I won't say parasites, but we are reliant on the international journal system? So these are a little bit out of order. I think I'd like to just mention, and it was, it was mentioned earlier, um, Lorcan's idea of the inside-out library. And this really aligns with what we're talking about at CORE. Um, instead of bringing content in for our users, we're starting, we need to change our model and how we work in libraries and begin to, which we're already doing, provide the content that's created by our communities out to the, to the broader um, user community. And this was also the vision that was presented in a report uh, published by MIT last year called The Future of Libraries. Um, and uh, so I would uh, encourage you to go read that report. It's, it's, it's very challenging and very interesting in terms of how we think about what the futures of li future of libraries are. So the one issue or the important point about this, if we move towards an inside-out approach to, um, to the role of libraries, we need to make sure that libraries are networked. There's, there's limitations to an inside-out approach for just the content that we're creating at our institution. No researcher is going to want to go just to our institution to, to, to think that they're finding a comprehensive collection of content. We need to ensure that our libraries are networked across the whole system. Um, and the challenge that CORE has been looking at in the last couple of years is um, the repositories that we use to provide this inside out content are super old and have outdated technologies. And so we can't really build those really exciting services on top of repositories right now because the technology just isn't up to, to, up to it. So um, about a year and a half ago, we launched a working group of kind of technology experts, I'd say, um, to 
provide some thinking, to do some thinking around what we need to do to repositories to improve their functionality. And um, in November 2017, we finally published our report with recommendations. And the report talks about 11 new behaviors for repositories and um, also provides the, recommend, uh, provides the technologies um, that we need to implement in repositories to be able to support those behaviors. So really the vision underlying this is that we want to reposition repositories as the foundation for a distributed globally networked infrastructure for scholarly communication, on top of which layers of value-added services will be deployed, thereby transforming the system, making it more research-centric, open to and supportive of innovation, and collectively managed by the scholarly community. Um, so Peter Noth, who runs CORE, C-O-R-E, which is an aggregation service at the Open University, funded through JISC mainly, I think. Um, he was on our working group, and he provided us with this, this excellent um, illustration of what the difference is between our repositories now, on the left-hand side, was essential, which are essentially our closed systems, and the only way we network our repositories is really through aggregating metadata and building very lightweight services on top of the metadata. So the idea is that we very much open the repository so that the content is open and we can build a whole bunch of different layers of value-added services on top. Um, and you can see some of the services li listed, listed there. And I just want to mention three of them that I think are particularly important for transforming the system. So in my, in my view, in my um, vision, is that we begin to build peer review on top of the content in repositories. So essentially, incrementally moving repositories from post-publication um, collections to collections that will eventually start collecting pre-publications with value-added peer review layers on top. The second area is um, really social networking. So um, recommender systems like, oh, you're reading this article? Well, there's another article over here that you may be interested in. The kind of thing we're used to when we go on Amazon or, or Facebook or, or any of these other um, networks. We want to build that into the repository network. And the third is trying to look at building um, some standardized usage metrics on top of repository resources as well. So again, to try to offer an alternative to what the journals are doing, we need to build both peer review, quality assessment, and usage uh, impact assessment into the system. So um, of course, this is where we talk about working together and the collective because no country can do this alone. If we're going to change the system, we really have to work together across at the international level to do this. And that means um, institutions and repositories adopting this common set of behaviors because we can't build the, we can't build those layers on top unless we have common behaviors in the repository systems. This vision also relies, it's not a peer to, it's not a peer -to -peer, uh, system. It relies on hubs. So if, if you can imagine um, a notification system would not be go kind of going peer to peer from one repository to another, those, those um, user activity would be um, aggregated into a hub, analyzed, and then pushed back in, into the repositories. And so we imagine hubs, but we don't imagine one central hub because we don't want to centralize the system too much. So we imagine regional and national hubs participating in this. And they also have to be kind of have common behaviors and common functionality if they're going to exchange information with each other. And so I think also another thing that's critical to our vision, I've really been talking a lot about journals, but um, very, very critical to our vision is that we're starting to, we want to expand 
um, the contributions to research by including other types of content. I mean, we already do collect other types of content in our repositories, but we'd like to have that into, include that into a more formalized system where it is uh, more uh, recognized and valued by the community. And so just briefly, the characteristics, this is, these are the characteristics I see of the system that we would like. Well, global for one. So uh, we want it, it needs to be global and it needs to be trusted. And I think this is one of, gonna be one of the real challenges for us is how do we build trust into the system? Um, especially in the, you know, these days where we're talking about fake news, um, predatory journals, we really need to do a lot of thinking about how we engage with the research community to ensure that the peer review and the comments are trusted and that the participation in the system is, is trusted by everybody. Um, I, I think I see it as being publicly managed, not managed by private industry. Um, as I said before, it has to be interoperable across repositories and countries and across the national hubs. And we also want to make sure that we have open APIs so that we can build not just the horizontal layer, but the vertical layers um, in terms of those service layers on top. And so again, I'd just like to make the case for why a distributed system is really important. It's really easy. The easy answer is to try for, to, uh, to adopt centralized systems. It's much easier to do that. But I think looking at some of the imbalances and problems that we have in the current system, you can see that uh, one of the things that would be important to be built in an alternative system is that it better reflects the local needs of different countries. Um, I think, but this would also, you know, safeguard against failure and we wouldn't be at risk of uh, Elsevier offering us a pot of money to buy, to buy us out. And it also, I think, hopefully would place the institution and the university library at the center of the system. And so just a few words about the current status of developments. So I said the report was published in November 2017, so about three or four months ago. There's already been a really a lot of interest in the recommendations. Um, so again, the two pieces are the development of the repository software and the second piece is, is the, the, the services, the hub services. Um, and we, we've already got um, uh, Open Air in Europe, the National Institute for Informatics in Japan, a group in, in the US and a Canadian group who are already looking at how they can help with the repository development. And I actually think that's the easiest piece of the puzzle. So there's quite a bit of interest there and I think we're coalescing around um, and we're working with the platform developers to, to help them implement those kind of the, the new functionalities. Uh, one of the challenges with that is that um, not every institution has the resources to upgrade their software. So there will be a lot of work and core is committed to trying to help, especially in the developing countries, try to get to the highest level of software functionality. And then in terms of hubs, um, again, Open Air has been very interested in, in this and will be doing some pilot projects around um, building commenting and peer review into the Open Air system. Um, Core, uh, the UK aggregator, has already started uh, building notification and social um, social media kind of functionalities into their aggregator. And I mentioned before the National Institute of Informatics in, in Japan is also working on it. And in order to kind of spread this beyond, you know, um, the UK, Europe, and Japan, we're having a technical <coughs> meeting with repository networks in Hamburg in May 14th and 15th. So that the aim of that is to kind of spread, share information, um, and spread the knowledge from the more developed networks to the, to the smaller ones. And this is being done kind of under the auspices of um, uh, an accord that we signed last year um, to, and this was basically at the, sort of at the level of, we're agreeing to, do, to work together. Um, so there, this was signed by these 
different organizations in different regions. And it's sort of a framework for us to work together. And now we're trying to really do that at the practical level. And um, so I think this is all great, but we won't be able to really achieve our vision unless we do some other things as well. Um, and we published this um, five prerequisites for a sustainable knowledge commons a couple of months ago, and, and it kind of outlines the other things that I think we need to do. The first two are what I was talking about. So improving our repositories and our local-based systems, um, connecting those services across the world. Um, I think we need to start thinking about how we can re redistribute our funds that are all caught up in the big deal towards other open services. And I, I understand that's so challenging because we, we can't even get a reduction in price from any of these um, publishers. The price just keeps going up and up and up, taking more and more of our budgets. Um, but there is a discussion. I know Vanessa from Spark Europe has started a group called ESCOS, looking at how, how we can identify appropriate services that could be funded. And there's a discussion in the United States now um, that was started, it's uh, uh, called the 2.5 initiative. And so um, what they're trying to do is get the institutions in the United States and, and Canada too to, to sign up to say, well, we will, we will uh, move 2.5 of our budget towards open access services. But we, you know, in Canada, we did an analysis. We're already doing more than 2.5. <laughs> We're already paying more than 2.5. So perhaps it should be 10%, not 2.5. Um, the, the fourth issue, I think, is critical. How can we change the way research contributions are assessed? Right now, it's very much based on citations and journal-based metrics. And so if, that is the, if those are going to be the main measures for assessing research output, it will be very difficult for us to create an alternative system. Um, this is a very difficult challenge. Um, at Carl, we recently produced a, a, a briefing paper that was aimed at the vice provosts, I guess, or the uh, provosts, or, um, talking about how our reliance on journal-based assessment measures are, are, are having an unhealthy impact on scholarly communication. But um, I think Susan can attest it didn't go over very <laughs> well. This is a very difficult conversation to have with people in the administration. So we need to, we need to have the conversation, but we need to tread carefully. Um, and I think the last one here, oh, is, um, is maybe we should start thinking at the, at the level of the broader community about what, what are our principles around the infrastructure and services that we, that we use and adopt in our own local contexts. And this kind of came out of the B-Press um, acquisition for me, where I thought um, maybe our institutions could use a little bit of advice or a framework for helping them to decide what services they'll use and which ones they'll say, no, maybe I'll go here instead. And so I hope there will be work, some, uh, work done on that sometime soon in 2018, and I've talked to um, Spark and Spark Europe, and I've talked to David and, and Susan about maybe IARLA also participating in developing some common principles that we might share with the community, and um, so hopefully that work will be coming out soon. And, you know, just to, to put a plug in for the whole theme of this conference, we need to work together. If we want, we're going to change anything, we need to work together. We, we have a tendency to be competitive, and that's the way the system is set up, to attract better researchers, to attract more students to our institution. But we need to put that aside if we really want to change the system. And with that, I say thank you very much.